Welcome to Dorsey and Whitney's webinar on at the market programs for Canadian issuers. I'd like to introduce Chris Dirksen, a partner in Dorsey's Capital Markets and Corporate Compliance Group. Chris? Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Dorsey and Whitney seminar, U.S. at the market offerings for Canadian issuers. This webinar is the second in a two-part series of presentations on at the market offerings. The first was presented on October 14th, last Wednesday, by Tony Marsico and Nicole Stridham, and focused on at-the-market offerings for U.S. companies. You can review a recording of that webinar and the materials prepared by Tony and Nicole by visiting Dorsey's website at www.dorsey.com. Today's webinar will focus on U.S. at-the-market offerings for Canadian issuers. I'm Chris Dirksen, and I'm joined by Ken Sam. I'm a partner in Dorsey's Seattle office, and Ken is a partner in our Denver office. We're both members of Dorsey's Capital Markets and Corporate Compliance Group, as well as Dorsey's Canada-US Cross-Border Group. I'm also the co-editor of Dorsey's Cross-Border Counselor blog, which you can find at crossbordercounselor.com. At the end of the slide deck, you'll find some more contact information um, about us and Dorsey. Dorsey is an international law firm with offices throughout the U.S. and in Canada, Europe, and Asia. We have expertise assisting clients around the world with all of their legal needs. Our Canada-U.S. cross-border group is recognized for our expertise in representing Canadian companies, underwriters, agents, and investors on U.S. legal matters, including Canada-U.S. capital markets transactions, U.S. listings, M&A, U.S. corporate governance, U.S. stock-based compensation, tax, antitrust, employment, and regulatory matters. Dorsey only practices U.S. law in Canada, and we work closely with Canadian advisors to provide seamless representation by understanding key principles unique to Canada-U.S. cross-border needs. Now let's begin with a few housekeeping matters. Today's webinar is scheduled for 60 minutes a link to the materials and attendance forms were sent with Dorsey's email reminder. CLE or CPD credit is available in certain jurisdictions. The CLE code will be provided during the webinar for those in jurisdictions that require one. You should, to obtain credit, you should return your completed attendance forms to attendance at Dorsey.com. Questions can be submitted during the webinar using the chat feature by clicking the chat button. If time permits, we will try to answer some of those questions at the end of the presentation. If we don't get to your question, Ken or I will contact you directly after the webinar. You can always contact Ken, me, or your trusted Dorsey attorney with any questions or for assistance with your U.S. legal needs. Thank you, and now let's begin the webinar, and I'll turn it over to Ken, who will start us off. Uh, thank you, Chris, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Chris, do you want to flip the slide to the agenda? So the agenda for today's webinar is the first part, USATM programs, a business overview, and we'll go through and answer a few uh, key um, points related to USATMs for Canadian issuers. The second part, we'll talk about putting up an ATM and what the process and components are for that. And then finally, we'll conclude with um, how you use an ATM and maintain it uh, for uh, the duration of the program. So let's begin by answering the question, what is a US ATM? In a US ATM, and SEC reporting company with a U.S. stock exchange listing does a public offering of the listed security by selling shares through a registered broker dealer directly on the U.S. stock exchange at the then prevailing market price as part of the normal uh, daily trading that occurs on the exchange, usually without any special efforts. That seems pretty straightforward. Uh, today, we're gonna unpack that definition 
provide details on U.S. ATM programs for Canadian issuers. Our webinar is designed to provide the basics for an attendee that has little or no knowledge of ATM programs. And, can be, and we intend to um, present the program so that they can begin to understand the basics. Because of this goal, you may already know some or most of the information we present. But we hope that our program will be helpful in filling in any gaps that you might have or serve as a good refresher. U.S. ATM programs are created and governed under the terms of an equity distribution agreement. Sometimes these are referred to as ATM agreements or sales agreements, and it's negotiated between the company and one or more registered broker-dealers. Uh, we'll discuss the equity distribution agreement in more detail in the next slide. The offer and sell of securities under ATMs are registered under effective registration statements with the SEC. All offers and sales of securities in the U.S. require a registration or exemption from registration under the Securities Act of 1933. It's important to keep that in mind as we're talking about ATMs because ATMs are in fact registered offerings. ATMs are basically sales of the company's listed equity securities on the exchange in which they're listed in market type transactions directly from treasury of the companies uh, at, at, from the treasury of the company at the company's discretion throughout the term of the ATM. And again, governed by the equity distribution agreement. So what is an equity distribution agreement? Again, all ATMs are governed by equity distribution agreements, which sets out the terms of the ATM program. It's negotiated between the company and one or more broker-dealers that act as sales agents, and the equity distribution agreement may vary in scope and complexity, but they usually have the, uh, similar requirements, such as SEC registration, maintenance of the registration statement, representations and warranties, <clears throat> terms of the ATM, including mechanics, obligations, and covenants, indemnification, and <clears throat> for Canadian companies, Canadian undertakings. Uh, because an equity um, distribution agreement is relates to a public offering is very, very similar to an underwriting agreement that you would typically see in a normal underwritten offering. The equity distribution agreement is signed at the launch of the ATM, which means that all of the due diligence, all of the documentation, the prospectus supplement, and all of the work related to the ATM is done prior to launch of the ATM. It designates and authorizes the broker-dealers to act as sales agents for the ATM, provides for maximum amount of the sales, but no pricing because ATMs are conducted through the stock exchange. Sales are made at market price. Uh, provides for brokers' commissions on sales and reimbursement of expenses. Um, most ATMs require uh, that the company reimburse the agent for expenses and then uh, commissions are deducted from the sales proceeds. Sales on the U.S. stock exchange, as I mentioned earlier, for U.S. ATMs, they're done through the um, facilities of the exchange and optionally on Canadian exchanges. The company's shares are generally sold through a national securities exchange. And what this means is the SEC has specifically designated certain exchanges as national securities exchanges. And those include uh, the New York Stock Exchange, NYSE American, and NASDAQ. Um, and the reason for this is that uh, securities that are listed on these exchanges are deemed to be covered securities, which are exempt from blue sky regulation. Um, note that the OTCQX, OTCQB, and other OTC markets <coughs> are not national securities exchanges, and therefore ATM sales are not practical 
on those, uh, those trading markets. Uh, recently, the Canadian Securities Administrators, uh, administrators uh, amended National Instrument 44102 to eliminate the requirement to obtain exemptive relief from certain regulatory requirements to conduct ATMs in Canada. Prior to these amendments, companies had to apply for relief to conduct ATMs on the Canadian market. These amendments um, make Canadian ATMs more closely follow U.S. ATMs by removing a 10% cap that existed prior to the amendments and changing the reporting obligation from monthly to quarterly for ATM sales. You should consult your Canadian Council about conducting ATMs on the Canadian exchange. Um, it's safe to say that with these changes, we expect that ATMs for Canadian companies, especially those that are not listed on U.S. national uh, securities exchanges, to increase in Canada. Uh, U.S. <clears throat> style 10B5 due diligence. Um, securities uh, liability for registered offerings um, are covered under Section 11 of the Securities Act. And um, underwriters can be liable for material misstatements or omissions from the, un from the offering documents that are used for ATM programs and any other registered offering. Uh, as such, uh, sales agents and their legal counsel will conduct legal due diligence prior to commencement of an ATM program, in addition to requiring delivery of legal opinions, 10B5 letters, and auditor comfort letters. Underwriters can rely on a due diligence defense by conducting this due diligence and obtaining these letters. Quarterly bring downs. Uh, we'll discuss this a little bit more um, in the third part of our program, but because ATMs are continuous offerings and done under a shelf registration statement, uh, documents are incorporated by reference by the company's filing. ATM programs usually require um, what are called bring down updates uh, to the due diligence and um, bring downs of 10B5 letters. Uh, like I said earlier, the issuer controls timing, the amount, and the floor price of all ATM sales. Uh, this provides a great deal of flexibility for the issuer, and then um, the sales agent, upon receiving these notices, will affect transactions and sales of the uh, company shares on the stock exchange or through other electronic communications networks. Increasing popularity of ATMs. Since 2005, uh, the SEC had amended the, um, the rules related to ATMs, which made it easier for ATMs to be conducted. As such, uh, ATMs have increased in popularity and have been widely accepted by capital markets and companies across most industries. In 2019, ATM issuances represented 33% of the registered offerings in the U.S., while biotechs and uh, pharmaceutical companies and REITs use ATMs the most, ATMs have become increasingly more popular in under other industries. Um, as we see a breakdown of those companies that are using ATMs by market capitalization, 37% of the ATM issuers have market caps of less than $250 million. 27% had market caps between $250 and $1 billion. 13% had market caps between $1 billion and $2.5 billion and 23% have market caps over $2.5 billion. Uh, in addition, ATMs are popular in other jurisdictions such as the UK, Canada, Australia, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Switzerland, China, India, and Israel. With the recent changes in Canada, we expect to see an increase of popularity of ATMs in Canada. So what's happening in 2020? As of September 20 or September 30th, 2020, 406 ATMs were launched for over a 
$51 billion. The median uh, market cap for these companies was $250 million. The number of ATMs and the amount raised during the first quarter of 2020 um, far outperformed the metrics for those for every previous quarter during the past decade. And the number of deals filed for the third quarter was almost that of the first quarter or third quarter of 2020 was almost that amount of the first quarter of 2020. Market caps of companies using ATMs range from a low of $2 million all the way up to a high of $464 billion. ATMs are becoming more popular for companies of all sizes. We see a breakdown in this slide of the industries that are using ATMs. 40% um, of the ATM uh, during the last 10 years was used by health, the healthcare industry with real estate at 18% and energy at 17%. In the last 12 months, uh, use by healthcare companies increased to 51%, energy uh, declined to 15% and real estate to 14%. These charts might illustrate the need um, for liquidity, uh, especially during the recent pandemic. So um, who's using ATMs in, can uh, in Canada? Again, they have to be SEC reporting and listed on a national securities exchange. ATMs are registered public offerings, which means that if a company is a foreign private issuer and MJDS eligible, um, in other words, having a market cap of at least uh, 75 million US, um, it can use the MJDS system and will file on um, form F10. Other companies that are compliant with their SEC reporting can usually register an ATM on an F3 available for foreign private issuers. If they are domestic issuers, they can register on S3. And um, following the uh, SEC form requirements for those forms. During the two and a half month period from June 26th through September 4th, 13 Canadian issuers filed new ATMs under MJDS. Uh, not surprisingly, nine of them were in the mining and metals sector, two life science, and one clean tech. What are the benefits of ATMs versus traditional offerings? Um, ATMs aren't really a substitute for traditional capital markets transactions. Instead, they should be viewed as a supplement to those uh, uh, capital markets activities. Uh, ATMs are probably not the best way to raise large amounts of capital uh, that companies uh, re uh, require. So there are economic benefits, no pricing discounts. Traditional public offerings are often priced at a discount to market in order to generate sufficient um, investor interest. ATMs are sold into the market at prevailing market price. Uh, lower commissions. Placement agents don't need to engage in a full marketing effort uh, for ATMs, resulting in sales commissions that are typically lower for ATMs compared to traditional offerings. Uh, commissions range anywhere from a low of a half a percent to a high of approximately 6%, and it just depends on the issuer. No kickers. Uh, a kicker in a traditional offering might be negotiated warrants or other investor rights or discounts uh, or significant discounts to the market price. Uh, since securities are typically sold in market transactions, uh, there are less commissions and no need for uh, investor incentives to participate in the offering itself. Uh, lower negotiating costs. Um, so. ATMs are done under these equity distribution agreements. They're pretty standard forms. Um, there does require some negotiation, but uh, generally speaking, you can uh, put up an ATM facility um, for less cost than a traditional underwritten offering. There's less market impact because sales are, are, 
sells under ATMs are um, issued into the market uh, using the natural trading market itself. Other benefits include a typical uh, offering, typically in, involves roadshows and other commitments by management. Um, there are no roadshows or these types of marketing efforts for ATMs. Takedowns under uh, more flexibility and control. Because the issuer controls when sales are made under the ATM program, um, it provides a greater flexibility to use ATMs to supplement cash flow and also to um, balance uh, for balance sheet maintenance purposes. Less deal risk, uh, especially with the COVID uh, situation, sometimes we're seeing um, traditional registered offerings with market outs. ATMs don't have the same market outs. It reduces the, the risk for of busted deals or long delays that can happen with traditional offerings. But with ATMs, of course, you're dependent on the market and market demand and trading volume in order to execute. Chris, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Thanks, Ken. Um, what, one uh, comment just on what Ken has said about the, the size of an ATM. You know, a lot of that is really driven by um, the amount of trading in the issuer's stock and the size of the issuer. You know, we have some issuers that can raise, you know, maybe a handful of millions of dollars each month under an ATM. Um, but we've also seen, you know, companies that have been able to raise 250 million in a month it really depends on the size of the company and how much trading is going on. So <clears throat> as with other types of public offerings, um, there's a flurry of activity that's required between the time that a company officially kicks off the process of an ATM and when the first sales can occur. Uh, this slide outlines the main activities that have to occur in that time, time frame. These include filing and taking effective an SEC shelf registration statement, as well as any required shelf prospectus in Canada unless these steps have already occurred, a due diligence process, obtaining the required internal corporate approvals, negotiating and entering into the equity distribution agreement with the agents, filing a prospectus supplement describing the specific ATM offering, making all required filings and obtaining any necessary approvals from the company's applicable stock exchanges, obtaining legal opinions and negative assurance letters from counsel, obtaining a comfort letter from the auditors, and then lastly, making a filing with FINRA when that's required. In most cases, the timeline will be somewhere between two and four weeks, sorry, two and six weeks. Um, the factors that have the greatest effect on where the company ends up in this timeline is the shelf registration statement and the due diligence process. The timeline is usually the shortest if first, the company already has a shelf registration statement and shelf prospectus in Canada, if applicable, on file with a plan of distribution that already allows for an ATM and with sufficient room and duration left under the shelf to allow for completion of the ATM. And in addition to that, if the company has already done U.S. style 10B5 due diligence on a previous U.S. public offering and that all is required in the deal in terms of due diligence is to have the same law firms that participated in the previous due diligence exercise do a bring down which would focus on those things that have occurred since the last due diligence review. Conversely, um, if these things are not the case, um, then the process will take longer and it would be more likely to be at the higher end of this range. Because an ATM is a continuous offering and because pr the price changes as the market price changes, an ATM can only be done pursuant to a shelf registration statement. Therefore, it's critical to the process that an issuer be able to confirm that it is eligible to file a shelf registration statement on one of the forms that we will discuss. If an issuer is not eligible for any of the shelf forms, it will not be able to do an ATM offering in the US. 
I would encourage cross-listed companies to always have a shelf registration statement in place. It costs a little money to put up a shelf, but you never know when you might need one. Having one in place can expand the options available to the company and can make them available on shorter timeframes. In some cases, putting up a shelf can even allow a company to do an offering that otherwise would be unavailable to the company because in some cases, a company can continue to do offerings under an existing shelf, even if the company has ceased to satisfy some of the form requirements for that type of shelf. If the company is Canadian, the type of shelf you will always want to use if the company is eligible is a form F10 under the Canada-US MJDS system. MJDS stands for Multi-Jurisdictional Disclosure System. It's a special system that was put in place and agreed bilaterally between the US and Canada decades ago and which allows certain Canadian companies to do US public offerings where the substantive disclosure requirements are almost exclusively governed by the Canadian rules with only modest extra US requirements. Offerings done under MJDS are also not normally reviewed by the SEC staff, which helps them to occur more quickly and with less risk. Under this system, generally, a company will make the applicable filings in both Canada and the U.S. concurrently. At the first stage, filing the Canadian Shelf Prospectus and the SEC Shelf Registration Statement concurrently and at the second stage, filing the prospectus supplement in Canada and with the SEC concurrently. The MJDS registration statement form for a shelf registration statement is called Form F10. It requires several things for an issuer to be eligible. First, an issuer must be incorporated or organized under Canadian law. If the company is merely run out of Canada, but it's technically a U.S. company or is formed in some other jurisdiction other than Canada, it would not be eligible. Second, the company must have been publicly reporting in Canada in at least one Canadian jurisdiction for at least 12 months and must be currently in compliance with its Canadian continuous disclosure requirements. Third, the company must be what the SEC calls a foreign private issuer. This definition weeds out some companies that have such strong U.S. connections that the SEC requires them to be treated the same as U.S. companies. We'll discuss this definition in more detail on the next slide. Fourth, the company must have a public float of common equity shares calculated in the manner required by the SEC of at least 75 million U.S. dollars. We'll discuss this test in more detail on another slide as well. Fifth, the company cannot be an investment company. This generally refers to companies like mutual funds that are in the business of making minority investments in other entities. Sometimes companies that consider themselves operating companies can also have difficulties under this test if they have major assets held through minority interests such as a one-off investment possibly obtained through a sale of an asset, or in cases where they have joint ventures where they're not the majority owner. In those cases, further analysis is required to identify an exemption from investment company status. For purposes of a Form F-10 filed by a company that is already an SEC reporting company, the definition of foreign private issuer will be any non-governmental issuer organized under the laws of a non-U.S. jurisdiction as long as, as of the last business day of its most recently completed second fiscal quarter. So that would mean for a December year-end company as of the most recent uh, end of June that has occurred it did not have both of the things that are outlined here. So it did not have a majority of its voting securities held directly or indirectly by U.S. residents. And for purposes of this test, a company is required to look through 
holders like CDS, DTC, brokers, and other persons who hold on behalf of third parties to count the beneficial owners as the owners, and to also take into account any other available information such as SETI reports in Canada or SEC beneficial ownership reports. And a company will not be a foreign private issuer if it's majority U.S. owned under this test. And then in addition to being majority U.S. owned, it has one, any one of the following additional U.S. nexuses. A majority of its directors or executive officers are U.S. citizens or residents. A majority of its assets are in the United States. Or the issuer's business is administered principally in the United States. As discussed, to be F10 eligible, the company must have at least a 75 million US dollar market float. The company is allowed to run the calculation as of any day within 60 days prior to filing the form F10. This means that a company that's on the edge of passing or failing the test can time the calculation and pick the date that is most favorable within the 60 day period. To run the test, the company must first identify those shareholders who exercised control or discretion over more than 10% of the outstanding equity shares as of the end of the most recently completed fiscal year. These are the excluded shareholders. Any shares that those persons hold as of the date that the public float is being calculated are not counted toward the public float. Then, uh, as of the date of the calculation, public float is calculated by multiplying the current market price of the shares on, on that date in the principal market for the company's shares and multiplying that by all outstanding shares other than the shares that are then held by the excluded shareholders. This slide outlines the required content for the Form F10 and the mechanics for filing it. The Form F-10 includes and is based upon the Canadian Shelf Prospectus. However, a company must add to the Canadian Shelf Prospectus certain U.S. legends and a few other pieces of information. The F-10 also includes some extra parts to it that are not included in the prospectus, including a cover page with a fee calculation because the company must pay the SEC a registration fee upon filing the F-10 based on the total dollar value being registered under the shelf. Extra pages, including some other minimal disclosure, including the company's arrangements for indemnification of insiders. Signatures by the principal executive officer, principal financial officer, principal accounting officer, at least a majority of the board, and an authorized U.S. representative for the company. And then as exhibits, copies of all documents incorporated by reference into the prospectus, if not already filed with the SEC. Consents from any auditors and other experts that are named in the prospectus or the documents incorporated by reference. Um, this would often include, um, for mining companies, any qualified persons were identified um, in the documents. And then if the shelf is broad enough that it contemplates the potential of issuing debt under the shelf, a template form of trust indenture must also be filed as an exhibit. Concurrently with filing the F-10 with the SEC, the company must also file a form FX with the SEC, which is just a consent to service the process. And then in terms of timing, um, typically the form F-10 is filed when the preliminary shelf prospectus is filed in Canada. Then when the company is ready to file its final shelf prospectus in Canada, that is filed with the SEC as an amendment to the initial F-10. After that filing, um, the company would then request that the SEC take the F-10 effective and that is normally done promptly after filing because, as mentioned, the SEC normally does not review the substance of a Form F-10 filing. 
we're not going to spend as much time focusing on these non-MJDS alternatives, which are Form S3 and F3, but we did want to give you a sense of how a company that doesn't qualify for Form F10 could put up a shelf. Form S3 is the shelf registration statement form normally used by U.S. companies. It requires that the company be an SEC reporting company, have been reporting with the SEC for at least 12 months, and have timely filed all reports required to be filed with the SEC during the most recent 12 months, subject to some limited exceptions. Form S3 is the foreign private issuer equivalent form. It has the same requirements, except it's intended to be used by foreign private issuers and is only available to a foreign private issuer. In addition, for an ATM specifically, to be able to use either of these forms for an ATM, a company must also have either a public float of over 75 million US dollars or it must satisfy what we call the baby shelf rule. For purposes of these forms, public float is calculated differently than for Form F10. For these forms, you would only exclude shares held by persons who control or control by or are under common control with the issuer as of the date the calculation is being run. Therefore, you're running the test based on control rather than simply a 10% test and you're not backdating any part of that calculation to the fiscal year end. This may allow an issuer's S3 or F3 public float to be higher than its F10 public float. For example, if it can include the value held by a greater than 10% shareholder on the basis that it doesn't have control. If the public float test is not satisfied, then the issuer must comply with the baby shelf rules which means that it must be listed on a national securities exchange, um, which as we discussed is what you would really in practice need to have to do an ATM anyway. The company cannot have been a shell company during the last 12 months. And most interestingly of all, the company cannot sell on S3 or F3 within any consecutive 12 month period, more than one third of its public float. If the company is subject to these baby shelf rules, then the sales that it makes under an ATM must also be counted toward and are subject to the one-third of public float limitation. The one-third one calculation is technical, and uh, getting into the detail of that is beyond the scope of the presentation. If, if that is relevant to your situation, please reach out to us separately. Similarly, a detailed discussion of the content requirements for a form S3 or F3 is beyond the scope of this presentation. However, big picture, the main differences between an MJDS F10 filing and an S3 or F3 filing are in that an S3 or F3, the content of the prospectus and the documents incorporated by reference must follow the SEC's content rules. Any incorporation by reference is made by reference to SEC filings, not Canadian filings. The required exhibits must include a Canadian corporate legal opinion regarding the shares. And while the SEC often decides not to comment on a shelf, it would be more likely that it would comment on an S3 or F3 shelf because the SEC content rules apply. One other important structural element is that due to the complexity of trying to coordinate an S3 or F3 in the US with a Canadian shelf prospectus, given that they are governed by two different sets of content rules, what we have seen in the ATM context is that the S3 or F3 is often filed as a US only filing with no Canadian shelf prospectus. And the ATM itself is done as a, a, a US only offering. The prospectus supplement is filed only with the SEC and sales occur only on the US stock exchange with the company relying on an exemption from the Canadian prospectus requirements. We're not Canadian lawyers and are not qualified to opine on the Canadian requirements related to this approach. 
we would refer your, your Canadian legal advisors to understand the circumstances in which this kind of ATM with no Canadian prospectus is permissible under Canadian law. The due diligence process for a U.S. public offering is generally more extensive than the process for a Canadian-only public offering. In an SEC-registered offering, the agents are deemed to be statutory underwriters and are liable to purchasers in the event there is any material misstatement or omission in the prospectus unless a defense is available to them. Therefore, they have a strong interest in making sure the prospectus is accurate and not misleading. In addition, they have a strong interest in ensuring that they satisfy what is called their due diligence defense. This is a legal defense under which, if they have done enough due diligence, then even if there is a material misstatement or omission in the prospectus, they will not be liable to purchasers as long as they did not know and could not have known, given an appropriate scope of due diligence, about the inaccuracy or omission. What this translates to in practice is usually the agent's counsel providing a due diligence request list, the company populating a data site and providing an annotated response to the request list, review of the due diligence responses and materials, both by counsel to the company and counsel to the agents, a circle up of important facts that are set out in the prospectus and the documents incorporated by reference, but that haven't already been backed up by the information in the data site for which the company is asked to provide supplemental backup, a due diligence call with all parties prior to launch of the ATM, delivery of legal opinions by Canadian and U.S. counsel to the company and possibly other jurisdictions depending on the company's business and assets, negative assurance letters delivered by company and agent U.S. counsel, which are basically letters saying that they're not aware of any material misstatement or omission. And then a comfort letter from the auditors regarding the financial numbers that are included in the parts of the prospectus outside of the financial statements themselves. As part of an ATM, the company will need to keep in mind its normal Canadian stock exchange rules. So the company will likely require uh, an approval from the Canadian stock exchange on the U.S. side, if the company's exchange is the NYC or the NYC American, approval must be obtained prior to issuing any shares under the ATM. ATMs are not normally subject to shareholder approval requirements under these rules, but the NYC will require an acknowledgement from the company that if any sales are made in a manner that's not consistent with a publicly offered ATM, such as privately negotiated sales, then these non-compliant sales would be subject to the normal exchange rules regarding shareholder approval. Therefore, a company should either ensure that all sales will be only made in an ATM, or if other types of sales are contemplated, that none of these are made in a manner that could trigger stock exchange approval, such as below market sales to directors or officers, or below market sales of more than 20% of the company. NASDAQ's rules are very similar, except that it does not technically require advanced approval. It's simply an advanced notice. And in their letter that they require from an issuer, they require the issuer to represent that the vast majority of the shares will be sold publicly in the market and not in privately negotiated transactions. Now, the launch of the ATM itself is very similar to the closing of other kinds of public offerings. You generally will have all on the same day or uh, same couple of days, the final due diligence call or bring down, corporate and exchange approvals, signing the equity distribution agreement, filing the prospective supplement, delivering the opinions and related materials, and issuing a press release. Once the prospective supplement has been filed, and these initial deliveries have occurred, sales can occur immediately. The prospective supplement is not subject to any review or approval requirements by the SEC. Now, FINRA may require filing. FINRA is the self-regulatory body that governs U.S. broker-dealers. SEC shelf registration statements trigger a required filing with FINRA unless the issuer is exempt. 
The rules governing these filings have recently changed, so if you were familiar with them, you probably aren't anymore. Under the new rules, an issuer is exempt if it is an experienced issuer, which means that it has either an SEC reporting history of at least 36 months and at least $150 million U.S. aggregate market value of a voting stock held by non-affiliates, which is based on the same control test I mentioned for the S3 and F3 public float calculation, or alternatively, the issuer must have aggregate market value of voting stock held by non-affiliates of at least 100 million U.S. dollars and an annual trading volume of more than 3 million shares. If the issuer does not meet those standards, it will have to make a filing um, when it puts up its initial SEC shelf registration statement. Under the amended rules, however, the filing of the prospectus supplement will not trigger any further filing under FINRA, and that's a change from the old rules, as long as the company either previously filed and obtained a no actions letter with respect to the base shelf registration statement, or the issuer was and still is exempt from filing the shelf registration statement with FINRA. And now I'll turn it over to Ken, who will discuss how to use and maintain an ATM after you've launched it and announced it publicly. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, so now we know what an ATM is, we know how to put it up, and now we just need to know how to use it. And as Chris mentioned, once the ATM has been put up, it's ready for use. And the way that it gets used, next slide, Chris. The way that it gets used is by delivering to the, the, the company delivers to the agent a written placement notice, sometimes called a sales notice. These notices are set out in the equity distribution agreement. A uh, typical notice will provide a variety of instructions to the sales agent, including the amount to be sold, the period during which those sales are to be made. It can be a day or it could be a number of weeks the minimum share price at which the agent may sell the shares, any volume limitations that the company desires to impose on the, on the shares relative to daily trading volume, and any other terms desired by the company within the scope of the ATM agreement. Uh, sales are, are made through the marketplace and uh, it's standard T plus two uh, delivery in settlement. The agent, doesn't um, affect a sell under the ATM agreement until they've received this notice. A couple of things to note, um, with respect to providing this notice, uh, usually it's the obligation of the company to make sure that there are no blackout periods, which we'll describe in the next slide, and uh, no material non-public information. So most companies have blackout policies related to uh, trading by insiders, and they're usually tied to the release of financial information or uh, material non-public information that's available. Um, as a general rule, uh, sometimes you see ATM agreements that follow the blackout periods for the company, but uh, in most ATM transactions, they may not be uh, coterminous with the company's insider trading policy. Instead, uh, most companies whose earnings are material or consider themselves uh, to be blacked out within two weeks of their quarterly earnings. Uh, the analysis is generally once the numbers are firm, the company's in a blackout period and shouldn't be using the ATM. Material non-public information, uh, Chris and I both mentioned uh, Section 11 liability. Uh, basically, the same anti-fraud provisions of the securities law apply to ATMs. You can't make sales while in possession of not material non-public information. Um, no sales if a previously filed prospectus or supplement contains any material misstatement or omissions. And this is a facts and circumstance analysis. 
and it's done irrespective of blackout dates or trading windows. Next slide. Uh, regulation M. This is a regulation that is designed to prevent market manipulation by market participants. It applies whenever there's a distribution of securities, uh, which is an offering distinguished from ordinary uh, trading transactions and the magnitude of the offering and presence of special selling efforts and methods are taken into consideration. An ATM program may to be deemed to involve a distribution. You have to evaluate various factors, facts and circumstances. Uh, basically, if applicable, Reg M prohibits ATM sales agents, the issuer, and certain other uh, control persons from, um, from uh, bidding for purchasing or attempting to induce any person to bid or purchase for the securities other than covered securities. Uh, during an applicable restricted period, the restrictive period for Reg M begins one day uh, prior to the pricing of each ATM sells for certain issuers uh, for a security uh, with an average daily trading volume of $100,000 uh, or more uh, over a two calendar month period or 60 day rolling period whose securities uh, outstanding equity securities have a public float in excess of $25 million or five business days prior to the pricing of each ATM sell for other, um, for other securities. So how does Reg M work in the context of ATMs or Reg M work? Um, basically, if a company's stock is actively traded, a broker dealer uh, can continue to serve as a market maker for the stock. If the ATM program is not actively traded, based on the definition that Chris provided earlier, uh, the agent is required to withdraw as designated market maker in the stock and no further business and no later than <laughs> a business day prior to the beginning of the first restricted period and for the duration of the ATM program. In other words, that market maker cannot serve as a designated market maker for the stock, even if the stock later becomes actively traded. Uh, Regulation M can require effective communications uh, to and related to blackout periods to persons that are prohibited from purchasing um, the securities agents <clears throat> may be required to provide FINRA uh, notices related to uh, Regulation M, such as uh, Regulation M restricted period notifications and Regulation M trading notifications under Regulation M. So, um, when can research coverage be provided when an, an agent is involved in an ATM um, transaction. You, you, you evaluate this under three separate scenarios. One is a safe harbor available under Rule 139. And if an issuer meets certain qualifications, such as S3 eligibility, which uh, Chris went over earlier, um, public float in excess of 75 million, uh, made timely filings, and is not a blank check company uh, over the last three years, then the safe harbor under Rule 139 applies. Uh, in addition, if the company is an emerging growth company under the JOBS Act, um, emerging growth company is defined as an issuer with uh, less than $1 billion in gross revenue and no SEC registered shares have been sold before December 8th of 2011, then um, research can be provided for emerging growth companies. And then the Reg M uh, compliance requirements that I went over earlier. Uh, sorry, I'm going fast, but we're running out of time. Next slide. Uh, this ch chart shows um, a matrix for publishing research reports. 
again, if you're an emerging growth company that's the bottom row, you can generally publish research reports. If you are actively traded and you have a uh, market cap in excess of $150 million, you can generally uh, publish research reports. The two areas that are most problematic are issuers with less than 75 million market caps. Uh, those companies may require that um, a, uh, an agent suspend coverage uh, or terminate the AATM three days prior to publishing the report and not uh, facilitate any trades for five days after for issuers with uh, public flows between 75 million and 150 million, uh, they should suspend. Uh, they should uh, suspend the ATM program, uh, and three days calendar days before publishing a report, and then um, at least three days or five days if um, if uh, permitted under Reg M. Um, uh, not execute any uh, ATM transaction. Next slide. Okay, um, Chris had mentioned due diligence and the importance of due diligence. Uh, generally, this is continuous offering, so uh, there is periodic need to update the, uh, the due diligence, uh, deliver um, updated comfort letters and 10B5 letters. There's usually a due diligence call and the ATM agreement itself generally requires a specific notice this is for updates to the prospectus or registration statement and of issuance of securities outside of the ATM. Next slide. <clears throat> so under certain circumstances, Chris mentioned eligibility for the various forms. Uh, an issuer could lose its eligibility to make sales under an F-10 registration statement if it loses its foreign private issuer status. Um, a Canadian shelf prospectus generally expires after 25 months um, and would have to be renewed. Uh, under those circumstances, um, you would um, put up a new shelf and file a new form F-10. If an issuer loses its F-10 eligibility, you would look for another form in which you could uh, put up a shelf. Uh, form S-3 and F-3 also have eligibility requirements. And if uh, they fail to be able to use those forms, they'll cease to be eligible. Um, a form S3 or F3 registration statement typically has an expiration date after three years. Uh, and if it expires, then you would simply file a new registration statement, assuming you're eligible uh, before the old one expires and bring a new filing effective. Chris, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thanks, Ken. Um, so we, we won't have time to answer questions. But if you do have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to either Ken or myself. Our contact information is in the slides. Um, the slides are available in the reminder email that you got prior to this session. Um, that reminder email will also provide access to a white paper that we have published um, on ATM programs for MJDS issuers that um, you should feel free to download and circulate to anyone else who may be interested in learning about ATMs for MJDS issuers. Um, you can also feel free to um, register to receive um, our blog updates on the crossbordercounselorblog.com. Uh, that is a blog that is directed specifically at Canadian issuers, uh, underwriters, and advisors. So we try to keep the blog updates there limited to things that you care about rather than just saying uh, something happened in the U.S. and you have to figure out if anyone in Canada would care. Uh, we've also included uh, just in here in the slides a little bit more information about Dorsey and about Ken and myself. 
So thank you for attending. Um, if you need credit for CLE uh, or CPD purposes, again, um, complete the sheet that was available in the reminder email and send that to attendance at dorsey.com. If you have any questions, feel free to follow up with us. And uh, if you would like help with a, an ATM offering, again, give us a call.